Yes, you have serendipity to paint for a staggering amount of things on your life, ranging from the delicious potato chips or to have a literal life saving penicillin. Every day we use products like microwaves, boxes of matches to make our lives easier. But believe it or not, this ingenious invention that allowed us to live our lives hassle free were not a product of trial and error, but created entirely by accident. Herein, we've gathered some of most life-changing products that were accidental inventions. 30 inventions that were totally accidental. And you're in Aero the Info. All the things you need are in here. So, mega shout out to these guys. So, special shout out for these guys. Huh? Chad Beltran. Leo Noche. Hi, yeah, Leo. <laughs> and Sila Bello. Uh, I will acknowledge you in this video. So, special shout out for you. And for these people or these viewers of my channel, mega shout out to these guys. Can you guess the answer? Those who are answering it correctly, I will post those answers and yourself in my next vlog. So answer will be posted after this video. Almonds are member of A. Peach family B. Berries C. Nuts or D. Root crop 30 inventions that were totally accidental. The microwave oven. Percy LeBaron Spencer was working on many fronts in a high-powered vacuum tubes that generate short radio waves called microwaves. When he accidentally discovered microwave cooking, the engineer was doing his job as usual when he noticed that the candy bar in his pocket had melted. Quickly, Spencer realized that it was the magnetrons that were causing this phenomenon. So, by 1945, he had filed a patent for his metal cooking box powered by microwave. In early 1945, Percy Spencer, a Raytheon engineer, was working on improving some of the company's magnetrons. It had been a long day's work for Spencer and his stomach began to grumble. It was time for a snack. When he reached into his pocket and pulled out his tasty treat, the engineer was surprised to find that what had once been a chocolate bar was now a completely melted mess within the wrapper. At that moment, he knew he had stumbled across something big. Excited, Percy asked a research assistant to bring him a bag of corn kernels. When the kernels were placed on the table near one of the magnetrons, they began to pop. It was confirmed. The microwaves used in the radar equipment could cook food. Giddy with amazement, the pair tried to cook something else, an egg, which promptly exploded on the assistant's face. So what was going on? As it turns out, the microwaves gave molecules in the food energy, causing them to vibrate rapidly, and vibrating molecules are essentially what heat is. When something is warmed up, all that's happening is the molecules that make up the material are just vibrating at a faster rate. Hence, microwaves could heat food in a totally new way that had never been previously possible, by vibrating food molecules directly. Inside a microwave oven, the magnetron similarly transmits waves of energy. But since microwaves cannot penetrate metal, they are channeled inside a metal pipe, down into the oven cavity. Since the cavity is also walled by metal, there's no place for the microwaves to go, but into the food, whose molecular structure absorbs and converts the energy in the form of heat. The Post-it Note Spencer Silver had a PhD in organic chemistry when he came to 3M to work as a senior chemist in their central research lab. While trying to improve the adhesive that 3M used for tape, Silver discovered a less sticky glue. 
Ordinary adhesives are flat with a solid contact area for adhesion. It is this unbroken contact that makes glue so sticky. What Silver found was a glue that, while quite sticky, could only be formed into individual spheres the thickness of a piece of paper. The spheres would only adhere to things tangentially, thus the adhesive's total contact area was very small. The result was a tacky, reusable glue that held paper together well. Silver knew he was onto something, but wasn't sure how to market it. Early ideas included a sticky bulletin board for temporary messages, or as a low-powered spray adhesive. Silver kept plugging away at the possibilities of this new glue, presenting it individually and during seminars. In attendance at one of these seminars was a 3M scientist named Arthur Fry. Fry sang in his church choir, and to keep track of the hymns, he tore scraps of paper into strips to make bookmarks. Every Sunday, a few would fall out of the hymnal, frustrating Fry. In a moment of divine inspiration, Fry realized that Silver's glue might make the perfect temporary adhesive to hold bookmarks. At work, Fry gathered scraps of paper and Silver's glue and combined them to make sticky but removable bookmarks. The bookmarks were popular and handy, but people did need more than a few of them. Shortly thereafter, Fry sent a file to a colleague using one of these bookmarks with an arrow on it to indicate a point of interest. The report came back with the bookmark still attached and the colleague had used the bookmark as a note. Fry quickly realized that his bookmark had applications as an adhesive note. Fry believed so strongly in his invention that when engineers told him that a machine didn't exist to manufacture the notes, he went home and built just such a machine in his basement. When he couldn't fit it through his basement door, he knocked the wall down. Now he had his manufacturing equipment and a great product. The only thing he didn't have was the support of senior management at 3M. To overcome this, Fry sent samples to all the company's executives, who quickly ordered more samples. Management was quickly hooked, and their demands soon outstripped development's production capacity. When it became clear that post-it notes were viable in a commercial atmosphere, 3M's marketing went to work. In 1978, a team of 3M marketers flooded Boise, Idaho, showing everyone they could find the wondrous new notes. Many post-it notes were officially released to the public in 1980, and in 1981 they were named 3M's outstanding new product. The first artificial sweetener. You see them everywhere, those little pink, blue, and yellow packets of artificial sweeteners. You know they're hyper-sweet and calorie-free, but you probably don't know what else the first artificial sweeteners have in common. Saccharin, cyclamate, aspartame, all owe their discoveries to lab workers who didn't wash their hands. Saccharin, the one of the pink packets, was first. 1897 Johns Hopkins University. Graduate student Constantine Falberg was working in his professor's lab, trying to find new uses for derivatives of coal tar. That's a waste product from processing coal, a primary fuel source at the time. 300 times sweeter than sugar, in fact. Because he hadn't washed his hands properly, he literally brought his work home with him. Tracing the taste back to the lab, he did something no one in chemistry should ever do. Falberg had derived a compound from coal tar called benzoic sulfamide. He named it saccharin from the Latin word for sugar and, in fact, saw its potential to replace cane sugar. There were, between Falberg and his professor, Dr. Ira Remsen, some ugly clashes over credit for discovery and development of that substance. Before saccharin was finally patented as a sugar substitute, especially good for diabetics, because it didn't metabolize, it did not affect blood sugar levels. But there wasn't much of a market for it. Sveda called it cyclamate. Its arrival on the market coincided with the new popularity of low-calorie diet sodas in the 1950s. For years, cyclamate was in high demand and broad use. After tests linked it to bladder cancer, the FDA banned it from the U.S. market in 1969, although it's still used in more than 50 other countries. In the U.S., a new artificial sweetener was already in the works. 1965, the labs of pharmaceutical manufacturer G.D. Searle, company chemist James Schlatter, was trying to synthesize a new drug for gastric ulcers. Aspartame, the one in the blue packets, quickly became the most used artificial sweetener in the food and beverage industry worldwide, and still claims the largest share of the artificial sweetener market. 
As more Americans gain weight and try to lose it, consumption of all artificial sweeteners grows annually. Although new studies suggest they will train our taste buds to prefer the hyper-sweet over natural sugars like those found in fruit. So that's the dirt on the hands-on discovery of saccharose, cyclamate, and aspartame. Penicillin. Around 1928, penicillin was discovered one of the world's first antibiotics. But the man who discovered it is Dr. Alexander Fleming. Never actually meant to revolutionize all medicine as he later described it. Rather, Fleming came across to the antibiotic entirely by the chance when he left out a culture of Staphylococcus aureus in his lab for two weeks. And after that, he returned to find out that their growth has been prevented by a mold called penicillin or penicillium notatum or penicillin. It's trivia time! Barbie's real name is Barbara Millicent Roberts and she was born on March 9, 1959. Many people believe she's from Malibu, California, but she actually originates from the fictional town of Willow, Wisconsin. Her parents are George and Margaret Roberts and she has seven siblings in total. Skipper, Stacy, Chelsea, Chrissy, Kelly, Tootie, and Todd. Delicious chocolate cookies. Chocolate chip cookies. 75 years ago, in the kitchen of a Whitman, Massachusetts restaurant, the chocolate chip cookie was born. Called the Toll House, the eatery was owned by Kenneth and Ruth Wakefield. The cookie's recipe showed up in the 1938 printing of their tried and true cookbook. It was an immediate hit and captured the attention of Betty Crocker herself. Before long, Nestle, a Swiss food and beverage company, caught wind of the recipe and asked Mrs. Wakefield if they could use both her recipe and her restaurant's name. Her business acumen apparently didn't measure up to her baking skills, and she gave away the rights for a dollar. Facts surrounding the payment are cloudy, and it's questioned if she even got it. There are also rumors that she was given a lifetime supply of chocolate chips. Also hazy are the specifics on how she came up with the cookie recipe. Some believe she ran out of preferred ingredients. Others say it was a miscalculation on how the chocolate would melt. Among the more plausible explanations is that Ruth Wakefield was just that innovative and talented. The X-ray machine. On the 28th of December 1895, German physicist Wilhelm Röntgen published a paper detailing his discovery of X-rays. Röntgen was experimenting with vacuum tubes at the University of Würzburg when he discovered the new invisible light on the 8th of November 1895. Although his lab notes were burned after his death in 1923, Röntgen's biographers describe him noticing a faint glow from a screen covered in fluorescent material about a meter away from his apparatus. This was despite the vacuum tube itself being completely covered with black cardboard that stopped all visible light. Having reasoned that the tube itself must be giving off some invisible rays, Röntgen conducted a series of experiments over the next few weeks, in which he found that the rays could pass through certain objects, but not others. Due to his uncertainty over the exact nature of the new rays, he adopted the mathematical designation X to reflect their mysterious nature. As his experiments continued, Röntgen began to notice that the rays were able to penetrate the soft tissues in his body, but were stopped by bone. After subsequently replacing the fluorescent screen with a photographic plate, he made the first ever X-ray image, which clearly showed the bones of his wife Bertha's hand and her wedding ring. On seeing the image, she is said to have remarked, I have seen my death. The super glue. The cyanoacrylate uh, invention and discovery really involved one day of serendipity and about 10 years of hard work. 
since World War II and Coover was working as a research chemist at Eastman Kodak when he noticed that one of the materials with which he was experimenting made everything stick together. What at first was a problem, Coover ultimately saw as an opportunity, one that made him one of America's most famous inventors. The only thing between my 150 pounds and that wire will be one drop of glue. Here we go. Super glue had some gee whiz applications for sure, but Coover was most proud of its use by medics in the Vietnam War to quickly seal up soldiers' wounds. The implantable pacemaker. Well, back in 1919, Wilson Great Batch would come to be known as the inventor of the implantable pacemaker, called one of the 10 greatest engineering contributions to society in the past 50 years. It was determination and commitment that ensured Wilson Great Batch would find success. A walk up these stairs takes us on the start of our journey. These are part of the very stairs that Wilson Great Badge climbed each day to get to his workshop in the family barn. With just a couple of thousand dollars to his name, Wilson left his job and committed himself to the sense of discovery. The barn workshop would mark the beginning of his own journey that would offer hope to millions of heart patients worldwide. Wilson Great Badge said that he was always looking to make things better for people. And usually, he acknowledged, that meant doing some things differently. He said, all of life is experimentation. Face in your face. A bag of potato chips. A cat of potato chips. 1853, Native American George Crump was employed as a chef at an elegant resort in Saratoga Springs, New York. One dinner guest found Carl's french fries too thick no! for his slacking and rejected the order. Crumb decided to rally guests by producing fries too thin right. and crisp and skewer with the fork. I'm gonna make this fry extra thin. The plan backfired. The guest was ecstatic over the browned, paper thin potatoes, and other diners began requesting crumbs. Potato chips. <laughs> what we call Teflon. Inventing Teflon. The man who accidentally invented Teflon was Dr. Roy Plunkett. After receiving his BA, MS, and eventually PhD in organic chemistry, Dr. Plunkett got a job with DuPont in Jackson, New Jersey. He was subsequently assigned to work on synthesizing various new forms of refrigerant, trying to find a non-toxic alternative to refrigerants like sulfur dioxide and ammonia. According to DuPont, in 1938, 27-year-old Dr. Plunkett and his assistant Jack Reebok were experimenting with one such potential alternative refrigerant. Tetrafluoroethylene TFE. Dr. Plunkett subsequently created around 100 pounds of TFE and stored the gas in small cylinders. On April the 6th, 1938, upon opening the valve on one of the supposedly full pressurized cylinders of TFE that had previously been frozen, nothing came out, even though by its weight it seemed to be full. The two then decided to investigate further by cutting the cylinder open. Once they managed to get it open, they discovered that the TFE gas inside had polymerized into a waxy white powder, polyterafluoroethylene PTFE resin. Ever the scientist, Plunkett then proceeded to run tests on this new substance to see if it had any unique or useful properties. Four of the most important properties of this substance discovered were that it was extremely slippery, one of the slipperiest substances known to man, non-corrosive, chemically stable, and that it had an extremely high melting point. These properties were deemed interesting enough that the study of the substance was transferred to DuPont's Central Research Department and assigned to chemists that had special experience in polymer research and development, while Dr. Plunkett was then promoted and transferred to a separate division that produced tetraethyl, used to boost gasoline octane levels. Three years later, the process and name of Teflon were patented and trademarked. For a bottle of champagne. Don Pierre Perignon was appointed cellar master of the Abbey in 1668. As he developed several techniques still present in the champagne we drink today, his effervescent wines became so popular that the royal court at Versailles was demanding sparkling wine. The thirst for champagne was born. 
The monk created a superior champagne by blending white and red grapes like Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, still grown in this region today. Also, he pressed white juice from red grapes, which gives champagne its trademark pale straw color. Dom Perignon's techniques are still used today. Tasty chewing gum. Which left the door open for a general Santa Ana of Alamo fame, and New Yorker Thomas Adams. But this unlikely duo did not have gum on their minds. They wanted to sell chickle to rubber manufacturers as a cheap substitute. Their get-rich-quick scheme never took off. Santa Ana left the business, but Thomas stuck with chickle. After a year of experimentation, he flavored the chickle with licorice, and eventually sold the gooey concoction as blackjack gum. It quickly became a favorite. A flavored popsicle. Frank invented popsicles when he was only 11 years old. Here's how it happened. He accidentally left a stirring stick in a glass of soda powder and water outside on a cold night in San Francisco. The temperature dropped to a record low, and when Frank came out the next morning, he found that he'd unintentionally created a stick of frozen soda water. The first example of what we call popsicles today. A refreshing Coca-Cola. Created by Dr. John Pemberton, a famous physician in the 1800s. When the Civil War hit, he tossed away his lab coat for a button uniform and joined the army. After getting caught in a direct line of fire, he was given a life-threatening drug to ease the pain for his last few hours. But he miraculously survived and used his near-death experience to build Coca-Cola's $74 billion brand. Dynamite. Though the explosive substance nitroglycine was invented by Ascanio Sobrero, it was Alfred Nobel who used it to make dynamites. While in Paris, Nobel began to experiment with nitroglycerin, so eventually he accidentally found a way to tame the substance by mixing it with casel girt, though in the process, many people lost their lives, including Nobel's brother Emil. A box of matches or matches. In 1827, an English pharmacist named John Walker had just finished stirring a pot of chemicals when he noticed that the stick he'd been using to stir the pot had a dried lump on one end. Instinctively, Walker tried to scrape the substance off the end of the stick. Although not containing phosphorus, the mixture of antimony sulfide, potassium chloride, gum, and starch was reactive enough that when he dragged it across the floor, the stick burst into flame. The strikeable match was born. We call the medicine Viagra. Though Viagra is one of the fastest selling drugs of all time, its current use is a far cry from what is was originally made for. Evidently, when a Viagra was in trial phase, it was actually marked as treatment for a gyna or a heart condition that causes pressure in your chest. And though the drug proved to be ineffective in helping angina patients, but study participants did find that little this or this little blue pill was able to increase the frequency and potency of erection. Safety glasses. Benedictus was a French chemist, inventor, painter, composer, bookbinder, textile designer, and all-round clever clothes. One day, in 1903, he was pursuing one of his many projects when a momentous accident happened. Instead of having the glass swept away, right, and continuing what he was doing, Benedictus's inquiring mind spotted that something unexpected had happened, and on closer inquiry, he realized a flask previously contained cellulose nitrate, liquid plastic. Some time later, immersed in more of his many activities while keeping up with current affairs, he still hadn't forgotten about his accident with the glass. When he saw in the newspaper just how dangerous glass could be, our multi-talented hero worked through the night to see if he could perfect a glass that wouldn't break. And he came up with the idea of a sandwich. A plastic sandwich, 
putting together two layers of glass with a thin film of plastic in between, creating the world's first shatterproof windscreen. Brandy. Initially, wine was distilled as a preservation method and as a way to make it easier for merchants to transport. It is also thought that wine was originally distilled to lessen the tax, which was assessed by volume. The intent was to add the water removed by distillation back to the brandy shortly before consumption. It was discovered that after having been stored in wooden casks, the resulting product had improved over the original distilled spirit. In addition to removing water, the distillation process left behind pigments, sugars and salts. As a result, the taste of the distillate was often quite unlike that of the original source. Quinine Have you ever heard of quinine? It is one of many famous medicines discovered here in the Amazon rainforest. Let's find out more about it. Quinine is used to cure malaria a very dangerous disease that is spread by mosquitoes. It is made from the bark of the chinchona tree. The tree is named after the Countess of Chinchon from Peru. In 1630, she was very sick with malaria and had a high fever. A doctor gave her a drink made from chinchona and she got better. People in Europe heard about this medicine and then came to the rainforest to collect the plant. It was first called quinine in 1820 by two French scientists, Mr. Pelletier and Mr. Carantou, who made the first modern medicine from the tree bark. Pap smear. Dr. Babiniklaub and his wife Mary came to New York from Greece in 1913 and they came here with barely any money and with no employment and they had to start a new life. It took him about a year to uh, find a position here at Cornell. He also discovered that he could analyze reproductive cycle guinea pigs through vaginal smears. And he needed a human subject and at the time he wasn't licensed to practice medicine here. And so his first human subject was Mary, his wife. He used samples from Mary to study what the cells looked like of laid the groundwork to see how these cells would look like in the face of cancer. Dry cleaning. In 1821, Thomas Jennings became the first African American to be granted a patent. Jennings invented the process of dry scouring, a forerunner to dry cleaning. Regardless of how the lawyers may have felt, Jennings had staked a claim for black inventors. And once slavery was abolished, a steady flow of African Americans was able to patent their inventions. Vulcanized Rubber Inventor Charles Goodyear Determined, obsessed, and broke. From a tenement kitchen, he'll kickstart a transport revolution. Native Americans in the Amazon have used it for centuries. Extracting a white sap from trees. They call it caoutchouc. In its raw state, rubber isn't very useful. It melts when hot, cracks when cold. Goodyear tries to change its chemical structure to make it more resilient and more useful. For five years, nothing. His debts consign him to jail. His family relies on handouts. But Goodyear believes he's divinely inspired. He 
There's no object so desirable, so important, and so necessary to the human race as making rubber available for man's use. Then, a breakthrough. He adds sulfur. The result? A material tough like leather, but flexible. He calls the process vulcanization, after the Roman god of fire. Vaseline. My name is Robert Augustus Chesabro. And I have invented a new and useful product from petroleum, which I have named Vaseline. Born January 9th, 1837. Died September 8th, 1933. I wanted to hear from the everyday worker and randomly took a tour and began speaking with the people no one cared about, the drillers, and asked them questions about their job, hoping that would lead to something more. When I was done, I reached in to shake their hand to say goodbye, and I immediately noticed how incredibly soft and smooth their hands were. It didn't make sense to me, because he was an outdoor driller working outside with his bare hands. Just when I was going to ask him, I noticed another driller rubbing his hands and arms with the black goo coming from the drill rods. When I asked what it was, they called it rod wax, and it was a useless byproduct that came from the crude oil that would stick as they drilled down. When I asked why they rubbed it on their hands, they said it helped heal cuts so they would occasionally grab some and rub it in. I knew instantly that this was what I really came for, and I immediately asked if I could have samples. They did better and gave me buckets for free, telling me it was worthless anyway, as they laughed me off. As soon as I returned home, I began experimenting and trying to figure out its chemical properties and if it really was some magic healer. Everyone called me a fool for turning down actual oil and wasting my time on something oil companies gave away for free. To them, I was just some poor, uneducated chemist chasing after an imaginary product that would never work. There were times when I questioned if any of this was even worth it, and that maybe they were right. But I'd look down at my buckets of foolish rod wax and remembered that I had a goal. So I ignored them and decided to pursue my passion. I poured every minute of my life into what I believed in, and after 10 years of experimenting and perfecting my product, I finally did it. I triple purified the black rod wax into a clear, odorless, and smooth jelly and learned that it actually didn't have any healing properties. Instead, it acted more like a protective layer, lowering the risk of infection. While doctors were still using gauze, I had discovered a new type of band-aid that protected people from infections where even a simple cut killed people. The ice cream cone. It's the summer of 1904, and visitors to the St. Louis World's Fair ride the huge Ferris wheel and dine on delicacies from around the world. Everyone is lining up for ice cream, but the vendors are turning people away. Why? They've run out of bowls, and vendors are losing money. That's when inspiration strikes food vendor Charles Manches. Here's what he does. He grabs a wooden fid, usually used to split tent rope, and heads over to his waffle maker. He pours the batter, cooks a waffle, and uses the fid to roll a cone. He plops a few scoops of ice cream on top, and he's back in business lickety split. Well, that's one story. Another version says that waffle maker Ernest Hamwe and ice cream vendor Arno Fornachow teamed up at the fair to invent the cone. Oh, and don't forget Abe Dumar, yet another vendor at the fair. His family claims it was Abe who came up with the idea. Botox treatment. 
Clostridium botulinum, from which the brand name Botox is derived, is one of the most poisonous substances known. If evenly dispersed and inhaled, a single gram would kill more than a million people. In the 1960s, a milder version, the so-called type A toxin, was first used to treat people with facial tics. A cosmetic wonder drug had been born, albeit by accident. Teabag. Tea bags were invented by mistake. When Mr. Thomas Sullivan, tea merchant, wanted to reduce the expenditures by putting samples of tea in bags made from cheap material, gauze, rather than in metal boxes and distributed them to traders. They thought it was a new way to prepare tea by elaborating tea bags in water and boil it. That method was impressed the traders because it has become easy to get rid of the tea sediments. The safety pin. Walter Hunt, born in New York State in 1796, yet his most commonplace invention is, by far, the safety pin. People have always needed fastening devices, and Walter wasn't the first person to come up with the idea of attaching clothing with metal pins, Ouch. but his design included the all-important clasp, which keeps the pin closed while also keeping the pointed end safely tucked away. The other side of Walter's pin has a twisted end that works like a spring, keeping the pin closed. Silly putty. Silly putty was originally invented by James Wright, working at General Electric's New Haven, Connecticut lab in 1943. At the time, the Allies were desperately short on rubber, owing to Japan invading various rubber-producing countries in the Pacific Rim. This shortage on rubber was negatively affecting certain wartime production efforts. As a result of this, the US government enlisted the aid of various companies to try and invent a synthetic rubber that could be made of readily available materials. It was during one of these attempts to create synthetic rubber that Wright mixed boric acid and silicone oil, making the first silly putty, which initially became known as nutty putty. Bubble wrap. In a room with walls covered in bubble wrap, you'd probably be left scratching your head. But when it was first made in 1975, this was the actual purpose of the invention. Further down the line, bubble wrap was proposed as greenhouse insulation, yet it didn't find success there either. Only three years later, it was finally noticed as a good wrapping material and found its place where it still belongs. Almonds are member of A. Peach family B. Berries C. Nuts or D. Root crop And the answer is A. Peach family So peaches has its own almond nuts inside So we will eat after it was opened